Welcome to the Innovation in Higher Education podcast, where we share the diverse views and perspectives of experts in higher education, innovation, technology, and entrepreneurship from all around the world on topics related to the future of higher education and the future of work in an engaging, fresh, friendly, and very human format. Let's get started. Welcome to a new episode of the Innovation in Higher Education podcast. My name is Juliana Rojas, and as always, I will be your host for today. The topic of today is the integration of AI and technology in business education and as well the need for cultural change and cultural transformation within universities in order to make this adoption uh, successful. So remember when we are talking about digital transformation, we don't, all, we don't only talk about adopting the technology itself, but the change of mindset that has to happen within the whole organization so that the adoption makes sense, right? Um, so, for discussing this topic, our guest is Oliver Matthews. Oliver is the VP of Degree Programs and CMO at Frankfurt School of Finance and Management. And well, uh, Oliver uh, has been very curious about the AI topic applied to business education, uh, so I'm sure he has a lot to say about it. So, hi Oliver, nice to have you here. Hello, thank you very much for having me. Yeah, thank you for your time and your openness to talk about this topic. So I would say let's start from your own experience with AI on your role uh, on your role uh, in business education and like maybe you can tell us a bit of because at the moment uh, to be honest I don't know what's the latest development because AI has been developing so fast <laughs> but I don't know if I am updated already so what is the status quo of the matter and if you have had some experience already or or some experiments with some programs maybe you can share some of uh, those insights with us Sure. I mean, it's it is a really new topic for particularly for people in in business ed education, in the management, for students. It wasn't the sort of technology that was easily accessible, and uh, and that's why there's there's also it's not that there's few experts. I mean, anyway, there's there's not a huge number of AI experts, but they tend to be in technology departments in uh, large tech firms. They don't tend to be in universities in education. Uh, and I mean, even from my perspective, I mean, my first interaction with AI was uh, about four years ago. And this professor from Frankfurt School, he came up to and said, Oliver, I've got this, I've got this idea and I wondered if you could help me with it. Uh, I really want to, uh, I want to test uh, a, an algorithm against your sales team. Basically, I want to write all of your sales emails and see if I can get a better conversion rate of mm -hmm. uh, of leads into students. I was like, this, this sounds fun. I mean, I, I'd never considered that this was, firstly, that AI was capable of doing this, that, mm -hmm. or that we had someone internal who was willing to. So sure, so okay. I, I handed over about a thousand emails that had been written by the different uh, recruitment teams, admissions teams, all of this content and context so that the learning model could be trained. Mm -hmm. uh, and now I know what he was actually building was actually a large language model uh, to to cope with this and to have the output was to be uh, unique, personalized emails to all of our incoming leads to convince them to study at Frankfurt School. I mean, that, bear in mind, that was four years ago. Chat mm -hmm. GPT, such an unknown back then. And he ran this experiment, researched it, wrote his algorithm, uh, completely bombed. It didn't work. Yeah, it was a it was a failure. <laughs> then, for me, it was like, oh, you know what? It sounded too good to be true. This will never work. Nice, nice experiment. I really enjoyed getting stuck into it and understanding how how it was going to work. And then, uh, and then we 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 left it. That first experiment went on for about a year. Invested some time in it. Then it died out. Uh, a couple more years go by, and someone comes up and says, "Hey, we want to have a go at." Uh, embedding AI into learning about our current students and then supporting them with extracurricular. We want to match extracurricular events to the relevant students, their desire, their background, their needs, so that no student ever misses an extracurricular event that could be suitable for them. Because if you think a university like Frankfurt School, we have an event every day. There's some guest speakers, some companies, some case study workshops, some career training. Every single day, something's happening. Uh, and we want to tell all our students that we get a high attendance, but at the same time, it's only relevant to uh, a, a very small subgroup of students 
who want that career path or that knowledge set. So the aim was train an AI tool to learn the background of students and feed them the uh, uh, feed them the content, the events. Now, this was not a large language model. This was not about having a nice, friendly conversation with them. It was very much about learning behavior suitability and feeding them new uh, uh, new events. Data, no new data. Basically. Yes, basically. Mm -hmm. uh, and we were we were well on the way. It was taking us some time. We we're well on the way through this project. It was about six to nine months in, still trying to train and get enough data into it. And then ChatGPT hits the market. This was November last year. Mm -hmm. I remember. Oh my God, there was a huge thing. Oh. <laughs> you know what? The, it was. It crazy. started so in Twitter. I don't know where did you find out about it because I found about I found out about ChatGPT on Twitter, and it's like because I am following and not even from education. Like I found out like for uh, because I'm following all the technology like uh, accounts like Wired and you know like. Uh, Tech crunch and everything, and suddenly, like it started like, with a small tweet, and then, like in a couple of days, it became like boom, you know. Like especially for the ones who were into tech, I think uh, for higher education, I just started seeing LinkedIn posts of academics in around uh, February or March. It took some time, but uh, mm -hmm. yeah, it it came yeah. really long way. For me, it was it was really it's weird. This is a super old school way of finding out about it. I read an article on it in the Financial Times. Okay. <laughs> now, for me, the end this is so nineties. <laughs> exactly, it's hilarious. But I still read it. It's a great source of information. It's not where you go for like what happened in the last couple of hours, but if you want to know what happened yesterday or this week, and get really in depth and reliable information, great mm -hmm. place to go. Okay. And suddenly, it's talking AI. And I was like, okay, sounds sounds fascinating. I read it, read about it. And first time you hear ChatGPT, and, and I said, like, okay, I put that away in the back of my head. I didn't immediately go to the website. I didn't see the, the immediacy of the relevance until suddenly it's, it turns up on Twitter. I see a reference to it on Instagram. Uh, I start seeing a couple of people mention it on LinkedIn. And it's like, I need to check this out. I have mm -hmm. to create the account. I've got to go figure out what's going on. And that was that was December, uh, December last year. And it's like, you the moment you get in it you see the massive implication of something that is so good that uh, it was crazy i remember i was treating it with respect you know because i really feel bad <laughs> when i'm just telling him what to do or i mean i imagine it's a him you know or her whatever yeah. what to do you know like and i always i'm saying like hi would you please <laughs> <laughs> and i always say thanks and everything <laughs> exactly but you know what what we do is we treated it a bit like google and I uh -huh. didn't even know I did it. I was like, I go into it. It's a question. yes and no, huh? because I in, in Google, I with that ChatGPT, I realized that I in Google I'm very keyword oriented because mm -hmm. I know that I have to talk like Tarzan to Google. No, you're like find yeah. best content for a higher education. Boom, you know. But to ChatGPT, I go into saying like, you know, based on the information that there is in the internet, would, would you make an analysis of, you know, like something like yeah. that. So, but you see, it's still you're assuming that that all of the data is in Google or in ChatGPT. You you're mm -hmm. asking a question, however complex and however many parameters, you're essentially asking a question and asking for data. And it wasn't until I did my first workshop on it with an AI expert that I learned about uh, setting up the environment and the scope of your discussion, and then giving it all the data and asking it to analyze it, mm -hmm. and changing the output methodologies. And when when I took uh, took um, 20 dummy CVs just to test, they were all in PDF, just cut and uh, cut all of the text out of these PDF CVs, text dump it into ChatGPT and ask for the uh, the core data in a table format. Boom. I now have a table with 20 lines of data, everything organized. And it says, how, how is it so accurate? How does it how did it make a mistake? Yeah. You just saved me hours of work. This is crazy. Oh my god! No, it's the best, the best assistant I've ever had. Like the <laughs> smart, the smartest one and the cheapest one. You know, like I, yeah. I feel I, I don't. Sometimes I feel it's not right to have him. You know, <laughs> like seriously, so so good. I'm now using like the. I don't know if you knew this tip and the listeners said, I'm going to give you a pro tip <laughs> that if you use, uh, I mean, right now for ChatGPT4, you have to pay like 20 euros per month or something. Yep. But if you go to the uh, Bing um, searcher, like the, the, comp the, the, comp 
Yeah, the, com the competitor, the competitor of, of Google, basically. Then you have it for free. I, I did a presentation uh, last week, actually, in, uh, in Edinburgh. Uh -huh. And I made a point of uh, all of the images in my presentation because mm -hmm. the presentation was on, again, it was uh, implementation of AI in business schools and universities. Mm -hmm. So all of the images I had created with AI. And there's another tool you can use for free. It's, uh, 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 it's um, im.ai. What? Sorry, how is it? It's IMG. IMG, it, okay. Yeah. And I, I was putting in the... Uh, uh, put in the description, some parameters, it creates four sample images, uh, and then you can then adapt within the image, choose the best one, and then say, add, add some more pictures, add some more windows to the buildings, add some more people in the background, and it keeps adapting these images, and this, this is a unique image developed for you, and I was describing on each slide, that's precisely the image I want, and it's royalty free, mm -hmm. and it's uniquely created for me. Uh, and then showing this and saying to everyone, say, okay, guys, so hey, I'm talking about the, the convenience. I've just bypassed a graphic designer, a photographer, uh, and I'm paying uh, no money th at the moment, at least, where all of these tools are being done for free, partly yes. for learning and awareness. Yeah, so yeah. Think of the, the number of roles that I've just cut out of a, of a unique presentation. So these, these tools are saving us hours worth of searching for images. Yeah, this is a sweet, and uh, right now we are in a sweet spot. Uh, what you just mentioned is, is very true. Like we're in a sweet spot of uh, the relationship user and provider of AI because they want to learn from us. So they kind of give us the bait, <laughs> yeah. give us the, the, the bait there for free. Uh, so going back, because I think we shifted a bit uh, as always, like I always in my conversations, I start talking <laughs> I about, I don't know, dogs and I end up talking about dolphins. I don't know. But <laughs> so uh, coming back to your experience with AI for business uh, education, so oh. you were you were telling your story. Continue. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. So actually, it was it was around uh, it's around December. Mm -hmm. Playing around with uh, uh, with ChatGPT, understanding from all of the articles I was reading and some initial research that we got uh, over the next two or three months into the spring, just how comprehensive a change was coming mm -hmm. that's the gap between uh usable uh, applicable ai for everyday businesses have just closed to the point where well we can we can actually not just open ai i mean open ai was one of the companies who have made it really free and public and marketed but there's uh there's uh, there's also open source models which we can you can bring in-house and embed it and that's actually what we we started to do is say, okay, we take this, we can immediately go to our, um, if basically it was that little uh, event learning tool. Why does it have to just be events now? Because we've got an interface where we can teach it with everything from our website, with our uh, study regulations, with all the curriculum. We can now provide a conversational tool that every student can not just interact with and get personalized data, but it can learn about them. Mm -hmm. uh, start providing them more and more relevant information. Everyone from an, a future student who just wants to know how to apply to a program to uh, an, an enrolling student who wants to know how to sort out his financing or a current student who wants to figure out what is the, the policy for any given program or module on the ECTS involved. So if we can, we put more and more regulations in and students don't read, we know this, they sign contracts, they, yes. they, they don't read their regulations or how the they accept the terms and the terms <laughs> and conditions <laughs> right? and we're all no guilty problem. of it but now yeah, me too of course so and that's that's where really kind of one of the applications we came up with uh it wasn't uh, it wasn't so much the learning itself but it's about making business schools themselves more efficient more transparent more usable to our students and to our staff because also don't don't underestimate how few staff think they know what the regulations are or what's in any given program, but they don't actually realize that in the last curriculum review, this element changed slightly or this regulation has changed. Mm -hmm. We actually now have a, uh, the opportunity to, to train and to retrain uh, new existing and long-term staff with the latest knowledge mm -hmm. and maybe even bypass the staff member because a student doesn't need to go to them directly. I mean, this, this has a pot potential to save hours. It has a potential to save many mistakes, give a far quicker and better service to students. Uh, and 
all of which is at a time when there's there is a, a serious staff shortage and that's not not just uh, in universities it's across industry across the, the western world for sure we have a staff shortage and uh, this is a it, this is a great way of uh, of plugging that gap yeah, I totally, I totally agree with you. Uh, I mean, based on own experience, uh, using it. Uh, I mean, I put myself in the shoes of a of a business student, you know. And as a student, you can also take accountability of your own learning with an AI because you can, for example, let's say, which is something that happens often in education in general, not only higher education. There are some teachers that you know, like some teachers don't get to you, you know, like because of the methodology or because it's not your way of learning and so on and so forth. So forth, right or some authors that as well uh, because of their writing style don't get to your attention or you don't or somehow you don't get hooked i mean it happened to yeah. me especially with law test texts i have to admit <laughs> when i had to take uh, the the like um um business law back in back in my bachelor's degree oh my god i couldn't i just couldn't read those texts um but what i do with ai for example is that i I use it mainly right now for learning and for ideation. So mm -hmm. I fit him my way of learning. Like I like to learn like this. This is the language that I use. Blah, blah, and and then I tell him, okay, explain me this super uh, hard text in like five lines in the most uh, in the in the for like. Uh, and I even can tell him explain it for someone who knows nothing about software or something like that. You know, like and it gives me the uh, correct answer in a way that I can understand. And I think yeah. for business education, this is like infinitely uh valuable because as well ma if you think about managers you know the role of managers managers don't need to be specialists and they don't need to go but they need to understand what happens with stuff you know so it's not only in their studies but it's when they go outside to work it will also be something like it will be you know like the it, like your your ai guardian angel that tells you in the year <laughs> what what is yep. you know like explains you things but of course it's very important and i think this is something that uh you might have research on that too, for sure. Um, the limitations of it, you know, and the, and the way that we should like how uh, we should be responsible adopters, you know, mm -hmm. like uh, there's always because as well, ChatGPT, yeah. uh, at least the, the third version, ChatGPT three, had a lot of failures, sometimes logical failures, and so so it's really important to have this critical mindset um, mm -hmm. in uh, when using it, right? Yeah, I mean, you see, you you just kind of you stepped from uh, scenario one to scenario two, and there's there's actually mm -hmm. three to uh, to AI at any university. Uh, I mean, the first one that I addressed was like, how forget we're a university, we're a business. How mm -hmm. does our own business get better for our clients who are the students? But the second one is really is exactly how you described it. It's the it's the use of AI uh, in the classroom by professors by students. How do they use AI to, to aid themselves? Uh, whether that is having course materials prepared within AI to provide adaptive learning, mm -hmm. uh, that's what we're also looking at, uh, to develop content which allows people to really to move through the content at their own speed, to be pushed towards uh, areas they're weaker on, uh, move very quickly through areas they can clearly cope with, and then learn about that for the, for the, next, uh, uh, the next step in their learning journey. Uh, but the other side of it is, okay, that's great. That's a very controlled environment because you know students go here, learn this, follow this path. It's, it's safe. But what you just described was what about behind the scenes? What are the students doing to take <laughs> short, uh, to, uh, to make themselves more efficient? Read this book and summarize it for me. Take that chapter and rewrite it for me. Write notes on X, Y, Z. I mean, that's very clever and it saves a lot of time. But it also misses out the gap that reading a text and making notes is the learning journey. Uh, and the act of going through a certain process helps, uh, helps your brain evolve. It helps your brain to understand and to learn how to learn. And it increases your own mental capacity. So if, and we kind of assume that every student is going to understand that if it's a good thing, they're going to be using AI. The tools are going to get better. Academics, teachers have to understand how students could be using it and forcefully adopt and understand and in, embed this into the learning journey and be able to go to the class and say, OK, I want you to go away uh, and you can. This is a book. You can use AI, take these sections, get your own written summary and notes 
and then we're going to apply it. And the question is, how do you do this so that students still learn, but they have to learn a new way of studying? And this is so critical. If, if universities don't adapt to this, if they don't openly engage AI in the learning journey, they're going to be teaching old methodologies, uh, old text, old lecture notes, old PowerPoints, and the students will be bypassing the learning journey. Yeah. And everyone's going to lose out. It's just, it's not feasible not to adapt. What you just mentioned about the, the uh, like how relevant are the references or the books or the text that, that, um, that business that, that the professors are using this is oh my god this is such a hot topic as well because i don't know i mean i have a, i haven't i haven't taught in a like as a main professor in a in a business school i have been an assistant mm -hmm. professor but i remember as a student still i mean i studied in the 2000s right like uh 2019 or something not 2000 yeah uh in business school um and People were like the professors were still using Porter, you know, and mm -hmm. you know, and this is from the sixties, <laughs> and we were in the two thousand and nine, and and this is another big thing because seriously, students are more uh, updated already than professors, like way mm -hmm. more updated, I would say. So this is a re this was a reality back then; it's still a reality now, you know. Like, um... yeah. So I I had a bit of a shock in uh, in Edinburgh when uh, uh, at the beginning of the uh, the presentation, uh, I assumed that of the uh, the hundred or so uh, uh, business school and university reps in the room, you're in the room to listen to me talk about AI, probably because you have some inherent interest and therefore you're curious and have tried it yourself. So when I asked the room, I said, okay, so hands up everyone who hasn't already had a look at ChatGBT, who hasn't created an account, thinking it would be funny because it's only one or two people mm -hmm. and three quarters of the room put their hand up. Now we are we're already uh, midsummer. This technology has been publicly known and on the market for what eight months now. I'm pretty sure if you ask the same question in any one of those people's classes, ninety percent of the students would put their hand up and say, "I I've, I've played in this and I'm already using it in in my homework." Ninety-eight. Ninety-eight <laughs> percent. Yeah. And yet the majority of the, the room of university uh, managers, uh, leaders have not even opened an account yet. That shows a massive gap in adapting to a new technology. It's, it, it cannot be something you miss out on. Definitely. And this leads me to my next question. So let's talk about the cultural transformation, you know, because technology adoption doesn't function on its own. It has to come together with a cultural transformation in order to, to make the adoption successful. No. So what are your thoughts about this in the case of AI and business school? Like as a from your experience from your experience uh working in business schools, um, mm -hmm. how do you see the this scenario? I mean this this is a this is a tough one. This mm. is a, <laughs> uh, this is a wave that universities and business schools cannot afford to miss. Mm -hmm. Uh their their students have to learn either with us or without us, but they still have to learn how to use AI in the workplace. Companies are going to adapt to it. Clients in the future, customers in the future will, will want to see it used. If we don't uh, teach them, if we don't use it, if we don't embrace it, we are doing a disservice to every single one of our students and future graduates. They, they won't have the skills necessary in the workplace. But education is not an industry designed to move quickly the the process for example of traditional education at least because ed tech at the moment is like rushing <laughs> right so traditional it, education or what, what yeah i mean but what is what ed tech but i mean ed tech is the the technology behind the teaching and that's that's been moving anyway um into online teaching into uh, with hybrid it's, it's a technology it's not the educational content per se. No, I refer no, I refer to the educational content because basically you yep. can uh, you can learn everything, like everything online. Uh, you don't oh. get a degree, you don't get a badge and everything. But what Precisely. I mean is like the, the topics that are outside, like that are out there outside universities, are way more advanced than what's happening inside oh. universities. Is what I mean. Oh, yeah, okay. So yes, no. Yeah. In that case, you're absolutely right. Yes, yeah. there there is. I mean, that's also my go-to. So when I'm looking right now to get the latest or to get quick knowledge on AI, 
I'm afraid I am going to. Uh, I'm, I'm going to Coursera. I'm going to YouTube. I'm going to exactly. I'm not going to the Journal of Higher Education right. and Technology. You know, like I'm because... not going to Springer. I'm not going to Springer. I'm going to Udemy. I'm going to Coursera. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, universities have a perfectly sensible policy of research papers, for example, before they go, to, uh, they get published. They go through a series of peer reviews. It takes. Uh, it takes years to write a research paper, to get it qualified, to get it accepted and judged and then published until it's applicable. Or you look at a single module uh, in a degree program that needs to go through a review process, a curriculum committee. Uh, it needs to be approved to the correct standard of quality. It'll get assessed by auditors and accreditation agencies either before or after it gets launched. But these, are, these uh, processes often take months and for example, a new degree can take a year, a year and a half, two years from conception to actually being taught and then spend one or two years studying it before you graduate that knowledge. I mean, students can't wait four years for this knowledge. They, they actually need it now. They need it backdated into their studies. So, I mean, that's maybe where executive education is far, far quicker. It doesn't come with a degree. Uh, you pay to attend, you get a, a one day, a one week, a one month uh, seminar or certificate program, doesn't need accreditation, doesn't come with ECTS, but you can you can get those things together within the space of a few weeks sometimes, mm -hmm. get it to market and make it available. And yes, you see that coming from universities a lot more. Yes, that's, that's happening. And I mean, especially for private universities, business models are transforming because they were really lacking behind uh, the competitors, you know, especially in the last the last years with the boom of uh like i think the online learning and the all the ed tech industries right now like with ai even more so uh, uh ranking high uh, there's a lot of investment in education the other um some months ago i was talking with an ed tech entrepreneur and he forecasted kind of like the investment in the higher education industry of ed tech will be like around three billion dollars so it's a lot it's a lot of money going around uh, investing in those technologies and yeah, yeah, I mean, universities uh, were not, uh, yeah, it, it was almost an unfair, an unfair, uh, an unfair fight, you know, an unfair competition. Mm -hmm. um, so coming back to to the cultural topic, so what, how how do you see it? How do you see it happening? You think that the adopt adoption will uh, is going towards the like the the good side, or it needs to be it needs to have more speed? It needs to like, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, it needs to have more speed. I mean, on the on the positive side, there are, and I, I hope I'm right in saying that in every university there is somebody passionately trying to 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 push this, to push their own institution, to push the teaching and the learning systems in this direction to affect change. Uh, but they will be some will be very successful. There, there's already some universities who are well ahead of the game. Uh, there are other universities who are, who are barely making the first steps and unable to. Uh, and you mentioned this difference between private and state. And certainly, I mean, we both know we're here in Germany. We know that private universities um, can, are able to move a lot more quickly than the state. Mm -hmm. The state universities often don't have the, the management structure in place to put, push through change quickly. Yes. They just can't do yes. it. Uh, and they don't it's more like a political organization, a traditional university, and that's very inefficient when you talk about like uh, when refer. I mean, it's inefficient when you refer to uh, time to market. You know, like yep. uh, yeah, yeah. So when uh, when I was talking to colleagues, I just assumed that Frankfurt School we were maybe and we're doing what we have to do. It's really necessary to explore this. Uh, you cannot uh, stay out of the game, and I thought probably we were a bit late. Maybe we hadn't adapted. Maybe we hadn't got our project started quick enough, and we're we're way behind the competition. And speaking to the competition, it turns out no, no, we're actually uh, we're still quite a lot quicker than many. Uh, we have ongoing projects. We're we're close to getting something to the students. We're we're developing concepts that can really uh, can really benefit. Uh, and I'm really hopeful that it's it's going to work out. But I I also know that with these sort of projects there's so many things that could also go wrong mm -hmm. things that won't work out perfectly and right now the biggest concern i have is still uh, the hallucinations uh, this habit of and you see it in chat gpt most obviously the habit of the uh, of the ai the large language model to make up what it thinks you want to hear 
based on inaccurate prompting or an absence of information or confusion of information, it just makes stuff up for you. And it sounds very reasonable when it does <laughs> tells you, but it's just complete nonsense. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good seller. Uh, yeah. What do you think? What do you think, like from your perspective, from your perspective, has to change in academic culture in order to make this adoption, the, the adoption of this technology more successful and more impactful as well? I think, I mean, I'm guessing openness 100 mm percent. -hmm. I'm guessing as well a bit of uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna go with hum like humility, humility or humbleness, you know? I don't know. Uh, I don't know. That those those, those are mm -hmm. my first guesses. But what do you think? Yeah, I mean, ac academia is uh, is an interesting animal. Um, the, <laughs> <Yeah>. uh, <laughs> you mentioned humility. I mean, if if I think of the standard professor, the academic who has spent their life dedicated to education, their adult life in particular in a research intensive environment where not many people make it through. And mm -hmm. there's a reason there's a shortage of, uh, of professors, particularly the good ones, it's because it's such a hard process. So now to tell them your, your way of teaching, of learning needs to adapt, and here's a technology you don't know or understand and you're gonna have to work with it, it's the only way forward. This is, this is a difficult pill to swallow. So is it humility? Is it openness? Is it the, uh, the ability to retrain our faculty? I mean, this, this is a big question. Uh, I'm, I'm not worried about the top 20% who are permanently innovating. And there are, there, there are so many academics who do stuff which is cool and new and you see it for the first time. I think, okay, that's, that's exceptional. I'd never imagined that, that way of teaching or that, that scenario in the classroom and it totally works really forward thinking but for every person like that there's probably two or three in the background you don't really notice mm -hmm. who are still just i have my slide deck i made it five years ago it was good then it's good now and the reading list hasn't changed and yeah. that that is becoming less and less tenable it shouldn't have existed even two or three years ago it can't mm -hmm. exist now this has to change it's definitely like it's it's not I mean, it's not possible, you know, it's not admissible. It's not, it's not admissible, I would say so. Yeah. For, for many reasons, you know, uh, uh, including the reputation of the university, you know, like uh, as, as itself, you know, if, if universities want to remain relevant, there, mm -hmm. there is, at the moment, there is a huge fight on the, on the reputation thing. Like, are degrees still valuable? Yes. Are they not? Because a lot of companies, especially, I mean, Talking about, of course, talking about the shift to the workforce, right? Not not about like academia and the academic career, but to the people that are want to go to work. Like a lot of companies are already not even requiring university titles, you know. Like, or give you an example, you know, this guy that I don't particularly like, but Elon Musk is already hiring hiring <laughs> software developers without a degree, but just but but um, skills based, you know, like. Yep. Uh, I mean, he's not, again, I want to say he's not the best <laughs> example, and I'm not a fan of him, but it was just the first example that came to my mind. Yeah. <laughs> about he, he has that. a particular axe to grind. He doesn't like higher education institutes. Uh, there's a few entrepreneurs like him who dropped I mean, out. I mean, a, a, a lot of entrepreneurs don't like higher education used to because, uh, I mean, uh, because there's an, this is another another topic, but I would just summarize. I think I can summarize it. And the like, when you're an entrepreneur, you need speed because otherwise, yeah. uh, otherwise, you know, like you, it's not affordable to spend five years uh, uh, learning something or doing something uh, to launch your product in five years. You know, you're out. Yeah. You need speed. Like you need to have it now. You need less theory, more practice. And this is this doesn't necessarily correlate with academia or traditional education. Mm -hmm. That's why I. But you see, this, I mean, this is an opportunity for universities to evolve. 100%. But it's not that companies don't value university education. I mean, they, I would say they value good education more. So at a time when the number of students going to German universities is dropping, year after year it's dropping, mm -hmm. because the, simply the population is uh, reducing in Germany. Every year, there's thousands less high school leavers across Germany, and there are places in universities that are, are empty. And particularly in the east of the country, in rural campuses, there is a significant shortage of students and some 60 odd universities are, are under threat of uh, uh, reduced budgets, extinction. 
And yet at the same time, places like Frankfurt School, in a, in a country where paid education is such a pariah, we're seeing increases in students of some five to 10% a year. And we're also seeing increases in companies coming to us trying to recruit students. So they clearly see the value in a well-educated, well-trained student with the correct uh, focus on, uh, on, on skills, on learning, on innovation. Yes, but you can't take it for granted. You can't just assume that because we're a university or because we're a business school, the students will come, they will learn, and the companies will hire them. It's not as simple as that. We have to stay on top of it. We have to fight to get better. And that means, exactly as you said, you have to innovate. What are the skills that are needed, not in four years, but what do they need this semester for that part-time job at, which as a working student in whichever auditing or consulting or finance company, they need the skills now. They can't wait for everything for four years. So we do have to adapt. Yeah. And if, if universities get put out of business because micro level learning can be attained through YouTube and Coursera and any other novel way of learning online, then it's the university's own fault because it is a missed opportunity. I, I totally agree with that uh, sentence. And it's a, it's a matter, you know, of course, it's there's a lot of capacity building to make inside higher education mm -hmm. for, for innovation and adoption of an innovation oriented mindset um and and i think the hardest the, the the cultural part no yeah okay i think it's it's our time to start closing this interview so i'm gonna uh, i'm gonna ask you um let's make a forecast you know like in a in, a, in an ideal scenario in an ideal scenario how should um how should academic culture be in terms of um uh, I don't want to say any adjective itself because I want you to say this, but how, what characteristics should academic culture have or shift towards um, a successful adoption of technology into education, in this case, business education? Oh, I, I, I'm going to be a little bit controversial here. Uh, of course, of course, we like, contro we, we like controversy yeah, in this podcast. We're all for controversy. <laughs> universities have to adopt really an unforgiving mindset unforgiving unforgiving what towards is, okay. academics towards academics who don't evolve okay like uh, an up or out like an up or out kind of in thing. A way, uh, okay yeah i mean it's there there has to be less forgiveness there has to be i mean you you know this uh this concept i'm, I'm just wondering how many of uh, how many colleagues i have who who have tenure and say what so i am i can't be under threat uh but it's it's that nature of tenure that uh if you have a good professor and they've secured tenure and tenure means basically you're you're secure you can't be kicked out of your academic position mm -hmm. uh but that that also allows for uh not not particularly laziness but a comfort of not needing to change the world can change around me but i know my stuff you don't have to adapt uh, it's the same idea with a doctor if i mean if a doctor doesn't update their knowledge if they don't learn about new diseases new treatments oh my god yeah. i don't want to go to a doctor who's turning 70 and is still applying the medicine he learned when he was 20 at university i was just thinking about medieval me medicine you know <laughs> <laughs> So, and that's and that's it. Universities yeah. have got to be more ruthless in. Yeah, in that's a good email, actually. That's a good email. Yeah. Yeah, and it's the trouble is technology is advancing far quicker than we can keep up with, and as students need it, we owe it to them uh, to force our uh, institutions. And I'm not just talking about Frankfurt School. I'm talking about the whole education system. Uh, we have to force our institutions to uh, to move quicker, to adapt quicker, to innovate. Uh, and to and to not accept any professor, any any academic program staying in the past, it just it needs to evolve. Yeah, yeah. Maybe this is something that needs to go into the like in the um, uh, university values or something like that. You know, like uh, like uh, uh, resignation is not an option. Something like that. You know, like or, or I, yeah. I bet if you read any university's mission and vision statement, somewhere in there it will state like innovative. You know? <laughs> it's it, in there. I think every university has to tick those boxes when they write their. Uh, their oh, okay, okay. 
yeah yeah well but from it's easy to put it on paper but it's really hard to actually see it it's applied like institutional changes are cultural no changes it's, it's super hard. okay so what else uh, apart from from being not uh from having mm. uh zero tolerance <laughs> towards <laughs> towards not evolution <laughs> i mean the i guess the other one is uh it it's kind of i mean you mentioned humility it is in that direction but it's a willingness to to, to learn from people who are probably less qualified. Uh, and it might even be a case of, uh, you mentioned entrepreneurs, I'm thinking of uh, technical experts who probably only have a few years experience, maybe are still studying, and that's a scary thing, is that some of the experts you see in, uh, in coding in AI haven't actually even finished their, their education uh, themselves. They definitely don't have a PhD, and yet they probably know a lot more than many established uh, uh, academics and university management about the technology involved and that willingness to engage to learn from people who are clearly more junior clearly less experienced that's your your humility that's the ability to yeah take a deep breath and and dive in and accept that someone here clearly knows a lot more in the space of just a year or two yeah. And also, it doesn't have to be a bad thing, you know, because they will, I mean, I am thinking about sen really senior uh, professors. I mean, they have the learnings of all their years of experience, you know, and that doesn't like technology and, and knowing how something works and stuff doesn't, doesn't, um, how do you say it? doesn't replace experience, doesn't replace experience. And I think that's very valuable. I mean, there are still people, professionals with much more seniority than this other guy, that the junior guy, but this your junior guy hangs more around in the computer, point. <laughs> and I don't think it's such a big deal. And I think this thing with the egos, and I mean, this is another topic, but I think yeah. this this thing with the egos also comes together with the, the nomination of academia you know like you, when you have a phd your professor doctor full superman i don't know and i don't, I don't know why why is that even even uh, right now um uh, still that's, that, so critical, you know, that's you know? A, so, um, the pet peeve of mine in germany this uh this addiction to titles yeah uh, this title addiction makes no sense i mean it's just you know your thing i know my thing we can work together that i think that's uh, the best approach you know like uh, that someone can have in order yeah. to collaborate with people that know more than you in something, but as well, mm -hmm. you know more than them in other things. It's, I mean, everyone yeah. has their, their their side, you know. Yeah, I mean, this this is one side where I think there's this, and that's just between countries as well. There's a different sort of culture. Mm -hmm. So uh, you know, I'm I'm from the UK originally, and the UK, the US, it's very much a first name basis, a far more equal playing field of uh, being able to approach faculty members, approach mm -hmm. uh, senior staff on a first name basis, it's, it is more conversational. That's really not what you get here in Germany. There's the need for distance, uh, using the correct titles, dear professor, doctor, doctor, before you can, uh, before you can even have a conversation. Uh, but you also see that um, I, I studied actually over in Asia, I studied in China, and, uh, and it was also very hierarchical there where uh, in China, in Japan especially, you, you couldn't even voice uh, dissent. You couldn't say, I have a different, uh, different idea uh, because there's a hierarchy, and uh, not just an academic, but even a social hierarchy. Yes. It's important. definitely cultural. It's definitely cultural. Uh, but then the question here is, is it good for innovation? Is it efficient for innovation? Clearly it's, not. It, it's clearly <laughs> not. So yeah, so I mean, priorities, you know, like a country wants to be competitive or you have to make some, uh, adjustments to your <laughs> to your whole functioning yeah. you know yeah well i mean this is a long topic to talk about maybe i am planning i'm planning oh, yeah. i mean i will talk i will contact you later i'm planning to do some like uh, it would be nice to do a discussion you know to bring for example you and someone that is a more traditional academic and something like let's you know like fight <laughs> no, but to make a discussion you know like i really want to have like this open panel and really transparent panel you know let's see let's see how it goes well, Oliver, it has been great to to have you here. I don't know if you have any parting words um, for that. No, for I mean, I, can, I would say, uh, I mean, it's great. Thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, I'm pretty sure that if you and I talk in six months or in 12 months, we listen back to our discussion now and we'll see everything that's happened in 12 months. I'm sure there'll be elements where we say, okay, we clearly didn't see how this was going to evolve. We didn't see that. Yeah. 
Of course. There's gonna, oh, yeah, there's yeah. gonna be a game changer in this market. We just don't know what it is. Yeah. And that's that's I going to happen. You. And that's that's the scariest thing, but that's a big opportunity, you know, because you can always build and, and that's that's the importance of building like an, an evolution culture, you know, a, a evolution oriented culture. Because nobody knows what's happening and everything is happening so fast that really the best thing that we can do is make ourselves adaptable and you know oriented to results <laughs> and not so much towards the problem well um i'm gonna anyways for the people who want to contact oliver um about this ai topic they can do it i guess through linkedin is the best best way linkedin is perfect Just i'm gonna perfect. i'm gonna leave his data on the on the on the text box down here and with me and with the innovation in higher education podcast will be until our next episode so thank you very much and bye thank you for listening to the innovation in higher education podcast Follow us on LinkedIn and subscribe to our newsletter to not miss any episode. You can also find us on Instagram and TikTok as at Innovation in Higher Ed. Cheers!